What don't I actually bother about? I mean, I think this is one of the great opportunities of this unbelievable once in a generation, once in a lifetime experience of a pandemic is the things that we don't really want to bother about, that we don't really care about are falling away mm. just on their own. I mean, and so notice that, make a list, pay attention to what you don't want to bother about. You, you may not be able to make these as permanent changes like, oh, right. I don't want to bother about those damn Monday morning meetings I always have to sit through, but they're going to come back but it's still really valuable information because why bother has two sides, right? It has what we, what has been taken from us, but it also has what we want to let go of. I'm Srini Rao, and this is the Unmistakable Creative Podcast, where you get a window into the stories and insights of the most innovative and creative minds who've started movements, built thriving businesses, written best-selling books, and created insanely interesting art. For more, check out our 500-episode archive at unmistakablecreative.com. Jen, welcome to the Unmistakable Creative. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us. Oh, I'm really liking your radio voice. <laughs> Well, I've done this for a while, uh, <laughs> but I also got a nifty new microphone, which was oh, one of the sounds nice good. raising funding. But, uh, you know, I have known you for quite some time. We go way back. In fact, uh, to this day, I still credit you as the person who unlocked the key for me to learn how to write books because you told me one thing that literally changed my life and I never forgot it. Um, I have taught that to students and, you know, I, I literally took one sentence you gave me and, you know, turned it into six figures. So uh, needless to say, I'm a fan of yours, uh, always <laughs> have been of your work. Um, you have a new book out, which we will talk about. But as you know, I very rarely start any interview by talking about your work. Um, so I want to start by asking you, what is one of the most important things that you learned from one or both of your parents that influenced and shaped who you've become and what you've ended up doing with your life? Mm. Uh, I would say that my dad taught me that when the going gets tough, the tough get going. He was in World War II in the Pacific Theater. My dad was quite a bit older when I was born. And that both has been something that has gotten me through some really difficult times to dig down deep and go and keep going and keep trying. He was a very much a self-made man. He was born into pretty great pro poverty um, and got out of the war and got home from uh, the Pacific and spent many, many years building a, a supermarket, little supermarket empire <laughs> um, in the 60s, 50s and mm -hmm. 60s. And so I would say that toughness is something I really learned from dad. I can also say that that has led me at times to um, grinding myself into rubble. It mm -hmm. wasn't always, <laughs> I didn't always take it wisely. And I think yeah. from my mom, I really learned to be a good hostess. To, and mm -hmm. that is something I do when I teach. Yeah. Having seen your dad go from, you know, being sort of in poverty to self-made and um, it, from what it sounds like being fairly financially well off and mm -hmm. then going and pursuing a creative career. I know you make, you, you allude to this in the book later on, which we'll get to. Um, what did you learn about money and security from that experience, particularly in the wake of, you know, going and choosing, you know, the path that you have in which neither of those things are guaranteed? I never questioned that I could make a living. I never questioned being an entrepreneur. In fact, when I graduated from film school, of all things, and I got my first job and I called my dad all excited. Um, they lived in Florida. That's where I grew up. And I was, of course, in Los Angeles. And I'm like, dad, I got a job. And there's silence on the other end of the phone. And then he says, why did you do that? <laughs> Yeah. Because so I was raised if, in one church and that was the church of you only work for yourself. And so mm -hmm. that is so deeply ingrained in me. And luck, I'm just so lucky I was able to make it work because I don't think I am employable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think that you're rare to have been somebody who grew up with that narrative because I think you know, the overwhelming sort of cultural narrative is the exact opposite. I mean, mm -hmm. I know this because I grew up in an Indian family. Mm -hmm. um, my parents would never say, why did you go get a job? The only question is, why don't you have one? <laughs> um, so I wonder how people, I mean, you've worked with a lot of, of, you know, aspiring writers, people who became writers. I mean, how do you begin to undo that narrative? Because I think that narrative limits so many people's sense of possibility. Oh, mm, that's a great question. Uh, I think the, I think there's a way that we have to claim and and develop the subtle awareness of claiming what we want 
and not getting it mixed up with how it comes out with the outcome. And if, I mean, right now, having worked my ass off for so many years to write a book, I don't know if I ever have another a book in me. Someone said it's like after you have a baby and I'm like, oh no, this is worse. <laughs> I'm exhausted. Um, but will that desire arise again? I mean, I started to have some thoughts last night. Maybe it yeah. will. Right? <laughs> so I think there's a way that people in our culture get it what they want so tied up with and what it's going to get you and what it's going to look like. And, you know, I I hear that all the time. People will ask me, well, you work with writers, but how many of them actually publish? And I'm like, why do you think that's the gold standard? Yeah. Well, I I mean, I'll tell you why I think that's the gold standard. I think Mm -hmm. that you you made a very interesting point in in terms of the lesson that your dad taught you, which is that, you know, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. I think that what social media, despite making sort of unparalleled amounts of creativity and innovation possible and giving us all these tools, has also done is paradoxically inhibit that. I mean, that was like my primary argument in Audience of One. I know. I love that argument. Um, And, you know, you come from a world that predates all of this Mm -hmm. stuff. Um, you got to see what it was really like to grind it out, to master your craft. Um, and so, you know, I kind of wonder what, you know, of course people, I think that's a, that has played a large role in why people think that the goal is to get published, that the goal of writing, the goal of starting anything is to build a massive audience around it. You know, we don't really sell, I mean, nobody celebrates the artist who lingers in obscurity. We don't put, you know, the people whose startups blow up on the cover of Forbes. We celebrate the billionaires. We put, you know, the people who sell a million books on the Wall Street Journal bestseller list or the New York Times bestseller list. And so how with the fact that our culture primarily rewards outcomes, do you turn somebody or do you find a joy in the process? God, man, it's hard. I struggle with it. I totally struggle with it. Just before you and I got on, I walked out on the porch. It's a beautiful day here. You're, you and I are in the same county. <laughs> Unfortunately, we're never gonna, we may never see each other in person for the next year. <laughs> but now we're in the same county, so we're seeing the same beautiful blue skies and incredible weather. And I just went outside, and for just that moment, I stepped away from all my worries about book promotion and, and plans imploding and everything else that's going on in my busy little brain. And I was like, oh, right, this is here now, this beautiful day. And and my mantra is I want to be here for it all. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we have to cultivate in our creative work. It's not a consistent though. It's not that we don't want the outcome. It's not that we don't get jealous of other people who get it, but that we keep coming back to what is it about getting this message out? What is it about trying some other way to get my book into people's hands? What is it about trying some other way to work my stories or what is it that I can find satisfying here? And I I was talking to a writer friend before all the pandemic stuff started and she has not had luck getting her book of uh, interlinked short stories, um, any attention by agents. And she was just devastated and she just had to take a break. She just had to take a break thinking about it and sending it out. I'm like, there's no problem with that too. There's Mm -hmm. no problem with finding our own timeline with it. Um, So I think it's really not to be too woo woo. I really think it's a spiritual practice. Yeah. I mean, I, I I would agree. And it's funny because I'm sort of, you know, logical to a fault. So when I hear stuff like that, I'm like, yeah, that's all a bunch of new age bullshit. (laughs) But uh, I think that uh, one, I I wonder, it's funny because, you know, Ryan Holiday was here uh, when Stillness is the Key came out. Uh, you know, it, there's a funny story Ryan Holiday told me once, somebody who, who worked with him once told me that um, they actually, when they published one of his first books, it didn't do that well. I think that was the, uh, trust me, I'm lying. And mm-hmm. somebody high up at our publisher said that giving this kid a, a book deal was a huge mistake. We shouldn't have done this. And, you know, obviously like that person has eaten their words now, which I find hilarious. But it was interesting because he has done eight books in eight years. And for the first time, he had three of them all on the New York Times bestseller list at the same time. And he said something to me that uh, I have tried to keep in mind throughout uh, this last year as I've sort of seen my own book sales and even just watched my own creative career about this idea that we all think that there is this next level mm-hmm. um, that it's going to mm-hmm. you know, bring us this sort of you know, satisfaction that we think we're going to get. And you in a lot of ways are similar in that you've done eight books 
that have mm-hmm. been successful. You've been on Oprah. You have literally accomplished anything that an author basically considers the gold standard of success in publishing. And yet you're still telling me you wrestle with this narrative. Mm-hmm. I, how, like, why? Why does, why, and why does somebody who is not in your position think that you, somebody like you doesn't, more importantly? Well, I think the answer to the last question is because we think there's somewhere we're going to arrive at that we're finally going to say, that's it. I did everything that I wanted to do. That was enough. And maybe that does happen for some people. Maybe yeah. it really does happen. But the very nature of creating is to keep learning and trying things. Mm. And the very nature of what gives my life meaning besides the connections to the people I love and and nature and um, you know, being alive itself is to try new things. Yeah. So I think that's part of what keeps driving us. But then we get caught in, yeah, if I can just get this, or if I can just get that, then I will feel good enough or validated. I mean, I certainly have done that. I wrote mm-hmm. about it. Yeah. Um, so it's just, I think it's too the way some of us are wired, right? I mean, yeah. some of us are really just wired to go, if only they loved me, <laughs> right? Sally Fields, if all, uh-huh. you really love me. And I definitely have some of that. Hey, business owner. Did you know that over 4.2 billion people are active on social media now? That means if you want to connect with your customers and find new ones, you need social. Hootsuite is the must-have tool for managing and growing your business on social. You can schedule content, publish posts, and track your success all in one place. Millions of businesses around the world are already using Hootsuite. Now it's your turn. Go to Hootsuite.com slash 30 free to start your free trial and get 50% off your first year. That's H-O-O-T-S-U-I-T-E dot com slash 30 free for a free 30-day trial and 50% off your first year. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that obviously culture plays a role. I mean, I, like I said, I come from an achievement oriented culture, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it, this drive will never go away. But I think that the thing that has happened is that once I arrived at the outcomes and they didn't provide what I thought they were going to, that it, it's ironic that it took that to appreciate the joy in the process, considering I literally wrote an entire book about this exact issue <laughs> and I couldn't get on board with my own fucking ideas. I know. I can't tell you how many people have told me in the last few weeks, have you read this book that somebody I know wrote, <laughs> meaning my own book? And yeah. I just look at him like, thanks. Thanks a lot. Really? Yeah, I know. Said. And she said, you don't believe your own ideas. She's like, why would anybody yeah. buy this book if that's the case? And then yeah. once we did that, it was kind of like, you know, sales just organically started to take off. And mm-hmm. I was like, oh, wow, I can't really control this. Uh, which I, I think really makes a perfect segue to talking about this book in particular. Uh, like I said, when you sent it to me, I think, you know, you had said, Hey, do you want to write an endorsement for it? I said, yeah, I'm happy to do that because I, I've always admired your work. I, funny enough, it, this may be actually the only one of your books that I've read. Well, yeah, uh, cause all the rest of them are written ma- mainly for women. <laughs> that would probably explain a lot. <laughs> um, but I remember you sending this to me and I think part of what, why I think it felt so relevant to me was because I was experiencing exactly what you're dealing with in this book, mm-hmm. which is this idea of, okay, I've done all this stuff, you know what's next and why bother at all with what's next? You know, I think you and I were saying right before we hit record that I had sent probably three versions of a book proposal to uh, my agent and she just kept sending them back saying, yeah, the publisher won't buy this. And I I got to the point of, okay, why bother? Mm -hmm. Uh, And so I wonder what prompted your exploration of this idea in particular. I spent four years and 500 pages writing a narrative, traditional memoir that completely failed as a work of literature. (laughs) And out of the ashes of that that came in time, there was another book in between there for a few months that my agent turned down, um, came this book. And so really when I, I mean, I don't say this lightly, but I think this is the book I've been trying to write for probably 15 years. Mm. Um, and it's co- coming out of my own, not only a particular two, three year period of, of great, uh, darkness and failure and, uh, my dad dying and uh, my, uh, my, I got divorced, but also looking at the patterns when I wrote that memoir of how many times in my life I came to exactly where you are, right? Why bother where you were? And instead of going through the process all the way and really discovering what I wanted to bother about, I short-circuited it. I went backwards. I went to what was safe. I did the same thing again. I tweaked it a little bit. 
And I couldn't let myself go all the way through sort of the, the falling apart, the dissolving and really asking myself, what, what do I want? I may not be able to make it happen. Like we've been talking about, I may not be able to, I may not be willing to give up things to make that happen, or it might not be possible. I might not have the talent or the fortitude or the skills, but am I allowed to even let myself want? And when I saw that pattern, um, it it just sort of all fell into place, how to arrange those stories and and different skills and, and things I've been teaching in different ways over the years. Yeah. So you you mentioned, uh, you know, the divorce, um, your dad passing. And I I remember this passage in particular, which is one of the ones that struck me because I kind of felt like I related to it. You said, surrendering to the truth that I couldn't fix much and I truly (laughs) didn't need to try freed me from the terrible conviction that something was fundamentally wrong with me, which is the belief that kept me imprisoned in the land of the lost. Now, I think that all of us feel to some degree that something is fundamentally wrong with us when reality doesn't meet our expectations. Mm -hmm. Um, and in your case, you got what you think everybody should have reality did meet your expectations. And then you, it was all lost. How do you recover a sense of, um, identity self and self-worth after something like that? And what do you say to somebody who still feels that way, regardless of never experiencing what you have? Um, that's a great question. I would say the first thing that I had to learn besides the passage that you just wrote that I can't fix everything and maybe I don't need to is that I had to stop being so cruel to myself and beating myself up that even when it was really subtle in the background, that's what kept me stuck in any kind of reinvention. And I've been watching it happen lately with the disappointment around the book's launch and the pandemic and everything, and how quickly our brains, or at least my brain, is wired to go to, there's something I did wrong. Yeah. And when I look back at those years and how much longer they went on, um, and how they almost ruined what is now the great love of my life with my husband, my second husband, um, is is that self judgment and that self cruelty over and over again, and thinking that it and replaying the past through the eyes of now. Yeah. Thinking if I only did this, you know, if I, I wasn't with my dad when he died, and um, and I beat myself up about that, and. Oh, really to the point of deep depression. Um, and because I could understand now what I could have done differently. And at the time I was completely frozen. So we know a lot of you have been listening to us for years and it means the world to us. What we do here at the unmistakable creative wouldn't be possible without the support of our listeners. If the podcast has been valuable to you, one of the best ways you can support us is to subscribe to unmistakable creative prime, which gives you access to transcripts, all of our courses, monthly coaching calls, live chats with our guests, and an incredible community of creatives. And it costs less than you spend on a cup of coffee every month. For the school teachers and people in our education system, Prime is completely free to help you with this transition to teaching online. We've packed it with a ton of value and actionable content, and we hope you'll check it out. Just go to unmistakablecreative.com slash Prime to learn more. Again, that's unmistakablecreative.com slash Prime. So when I think about the past, what I've realized is that and I've done this particularly in the wake of, of breakups where I will literally go back and replay every moment <laughs> thinking to myself, okay, if I had just said this one thing differently or done this one thing differently, it wouldn't have turned out the way it did. And then, I, you know, I think after, you know, seven months of that endless, pointless and utter, utter bullshit ruminating, you come to the conclusion that, wait a minute, the outcome is still the same. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and yet we get, you know, so absorbed in this being ourselves up. Um, how do you stop? Well, I think lovely to have, to find some practices that you can use to redirect your brain. And one of my favorite resources for that, and I'm sure you've had him on the show, is Rick Hansen and his book, Buddha's Brain. Mm. And if those of you who are science-based, that's what got my science husband, he's a scientist, into meditation. Um, So you have to find some practices because our brains, as we know, are plastic and they will do what you train them to do. And Mm. what we default to do is be cruel and hard on ourselves and others because it kept us alert to danger. Mm. And the thing that I find fascinating right now is that it also gives us certainty. So if I'm certain that I'm a shithead, wow, well, at least I can, I can be certain about that. Mm-hmm. 
You know, it's something, it's something to hold on to. The world sucks and every, nothing's ever going to work out again. And there's no reason to care again. Well, that's something I know. Mm -hmm. And it's much more comforting than moving into the unknown, than trying again, than feeling desire in life again. Mm -hmm. Um, So is you've got to find some practices. And I'll tell you one thing that doesn't work is positive thinking or fighting your thoughts. (laughs) (laughs) So that's not one of the ones I recommend. Mm -hmm. One of the things that you say um, about this whole idea of why bother is what's next is not a destination. It's not about your career or cause or community or creative work. It might involve those, but what's next is so far beyond those. What's next is wholehearted contact and immersion in life. Uh, And I think that there are two things that struck me about that. One was that it was vague, which I think is actually really smart on your part because I think you offer a compass more than a map. Like Mm -hmm. this is something I've been very intentional about or tried to be with my work is to say that I don't have answers, just questions and observations. How you apply them up to you in your life will be what wisdom comes from. Um, But I think that when somebody sees that, the fact that they don't have a destination is what's so troubling. Mm Mm-hmm. It is really troubling, but it's actually the opportunity. And you can reach through the microphone, everybody, or the screen or wherever you're listening to this and just give me a little slap. But because I know, I got to tell you, I have walked this. I know how hard it is. But the thing that cuts us off from the regeneration that we are in sore need of when we reach for this book is trying to get to what's next too soon. And what I think I've discovered and languaged in this book is this piece of this moment in this possibility in what we call transition or things falling apart or whatever we want to name it that we haven't talked about before, which is something has ended or been taken from you or lost its meaning or passion or juice. And you really don't know what's next yet, or you're not willing to name it and go for it yet. Mm -hmm. And in that moment, whether it lasts for a day or a year, or in my case, for for a number of years, is the opportunity to actually rekindle wonder and desire and energy for and love of life itself. And that's what you need to have the clarity and the direction and the balls to go for what's next. But what we all do is go, I need certainty, so I need to figure out what's next. Or as my client said to me once, this is where I always take the shitty job. Mm. Wow. I think what you've said is particularly relevant given the moment that we're in uh, <laughs> in our history. And you know, I wonder what you would say to people about this crisis in, in, you know, in, con- in relation to what you've just said. Because so the way I've thought about this, my sister is a doctor. She's on the front lines. Like mm-hmm. I quite literally, she is on the COVID-19 team at her hospital. And mm-hmm. every day she goes to work, I'm a little scared. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'm sure my parents are too. I mean, the pictures she sends us, we're looking at like Jack Bauer in a hazmat suit. And we're like, this is my sister. <laughs> um, and what I've realized is that for many of us, for somebody like me, this is a massive inconvenience, not a crisis. Mm-hmm. But for other people, this is really a crisis. Mm-hmm. What do you say to those people? I think if we're if you're in a crisis economically, or you're on the front lines, or you're you know picking up people's garbage, or you know all the different things that are still essential jobs. My daughter works in a hospital in Seattle. That you're about, you must be about survival right now. You must be about how do I manage my nervous system? How do I manage my anxiety? How do I manage my health to try to stay in the game without? taking myself out or taking my health down. I mean, that, that is to me what we have to do and what, and if you're listening to this and you're like you and I are, which is, this is an inconvenience. I, my income's going to be, you know, is already been slammed. Um, I don't know what's going to happen with my book launch, but like, I'm safe. I have a house. I have enough to eat. I have a great partner who has a straight job and has health insurance for both of us. Um, first time in my life. So wonderful. Um, Then I think the opportunity is to say, how can I actually start to notice a couple of things? One of is which is what don't I actually bother about? I mean, I think this is one of the great opportunities of this unbelievable once in a generation, once in a lifetime experience of a pandemic is things that we don't really want to bother about that we don't really care about are falling away Mm. on uh, just on their own. I mean, (laughs) And so notice that, make a list, 
pay attention to what you don't want to bother about. You you may not be able to make these as permanent changes. Like, oh, right. I don't want to bother about those damn Monday morning meetings I always have to sit through, but they're going to come back. But it's still really valuable information because why bother has two sides, right? It has what we, what has been taken from us, but it also has what we want to let go of. Mm-hmm. So I think that's one of the incredible opportunities. I also was was thinking today that in this uncertainty, which can feel so anxiety making and crazy making, there's also this open space. Mm-hmm. So if we were to dream into that open space, if we were to let more of our sense of desire and possibility flourish, maybe in journaling or in conversations on FaceTime with friends, our neighbors, we have we have this great neighborhood and we all stay six feet away and talk to each other in the street every afternoon in different configurations while we're walking our dogs and such. Um, what might want to be seen? What might want to bubble up? What desires and possibilities have some space now that maybe you have more time or you're working at home? I, I know that's not true for everybody. I mean, some people are locked in their house with their children and I get it. I mean, it's hard. So <clears throat> what I liked about um, the way you laid this book out is that you actually gave us a, a really you know l- l- linear structure, which is ironic because I think you are the person who taught me the most valuable writing lesson I've ever learned, which is that your structure had to be linear, but your process didn't. Granted, that was also the reason my editor made me work with a writing coach because she said, <laughs> I'm not concerned about your ability to finish a book. I'm concerned that you don't know how to structure, structure ideas it. in a linear fashion. I was like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's um, very common for most writers, including myself. Um, especially when you're making the transition from blog post to books. Yes. Oh my God. So true. Um, but you said something um, before we get into this this map that you offered. You said that every act of self harshness stops the flow of life and creativity that will bring you to what's next. Every time you insist you should be further along by now, or wish you had a different past, or otherwise judge yourself, you build a stronger barrier between you and your why bother. And then we've talked about self criticism and being hard on ourselves, but I think that the one that part of that that struck me is this insistence that we should be further along by now. Mm. I don't think I know a single creative person who doesn't feel that to some degree. And I remember Josh Radner, when Sam Jones interviewed him on the off-camera podcast, he said something that to me, that was like the moment in that interview. He said, a successful career in the arts is rigged for dissatisfaction. (laughs) Great quote. So true. So how do we deal with this sense that we feel we should be further along. Look, I started Unmistakable Creative long before podcasts were popular. I mean, we've been around since 2009. We're smaller than people who started after us. Mm-hmm. And there are days where there's no question this goes through my head. Yeah. Why, why aren't I farther along? Why didn't I get more attention? Oh my God. Oh, you want me to trot out all my stories about that? I did a podcast before there was a word for podcasting. (laughs) Um, Yeah. Yeah. So how do we deal with it? Well, the thing that I try to practice and that I detailed in the book, um, not detailed, but gave you how to do more specifically is this idea of what can you declare is enough for you in the actions that are dependent only on you, not on the reaction you get or the outcome or how much money it makes you, how many downloads it gets you. I call them conditions of enoughness, and I um, developed them over many years, and thousands and thousands of people have used them in different ways. They're particularly great for for creative projects because Mm -hmm. the very built-in, as your quote suggests, to being creative is being waiting for someone else to tell you you did a good job. But if you and I sat here for the rest of this interview and talked about our favorite books, I'm sure, or our favorite movies, our favorite TV shows or podcasts, we would go, you would say something and I would go, I can't believe you like that. That's just, oh my God, that was so boring or stupid or whatever. It is an assessment-based life. And if you don't find a way to declare what is enough for you, what satisfies you, what your standards are that you can taste or touch or meet or celebrate in some way, you and I... I could testify to this. You will drive yourself to the brink of totally quitting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's funny because as you're, you're saying that, I think about Clayton Christensen's book, How Will You Measure Your Life? And uh, how these days, you know, we have this sort of artificial quantification of our lives through, mm. you know, vanity metrics and fans and followers and likes and hearts and all this other bullshit that actually doesn't matter at all. No, and it doesn't, it's not satisfying because 
It's not something that you have any agency over. I mean, you're a great example of that. I, you said somewhere recently, if a person can't do an hour interview with me, I say no to them. Like that's one of your conditions of enoughness, right? I will have this person for an hour to have a conversation. Obviously, you have other conditions of enoughness about reading the person's work, about, you know, really, you know, giving this some in-depth thought. You prepared for this. That is on you. That's how you're showing up here. That is not whether people listening while they're making dinner get that or not. You get it. You are satisfied with that. Hmm. Wow. So let's get into this whole um map that you give people basically of leaving behind, easing in, settling, desire, becoming by doing, and being seen. Let's start with this idea of leaving behind. I think that, you know, it's it's funny. I think when I when I think about this idea of leaving behind, um, in my mind I go straight to labels and identity, but I think that there's, you know, other things in here too. You know, you talk about the emotional system, energy, the various narratives like being too old or too late or too broke. How do we leave all of this stuff behind to get to what's next? Well, we don't. I mean, that would be amazing if I had a magic wand and could do that. Oh my God, would I do that for so many people? It, but we have to start noticing where we are saying, because of X, I can't even consider the future. Mm. That is the essential part of leaving behind. How we are creating ourselves a little prison or a big prison of our own making because the past is no longer possible or the past has created conditions in the present that we say, that's it, my future is doomed. That's what I want to keep pointing out to people. And we do it in different ways. If we're ill, we do it around sickness and energy. If we're old, we do it around age. I'm not saying that there's I, there's lots of things I'm not going to do in my life at 57 in the future, right? That's just not going to happen because the, you know I'm certain physical capacity or, you know, I'm not going to have a baby again. (laughs) Mm. Um, You know, okay. I'm not saying we're denying reality, but we create these narratives, these stories, and they just keep snaring us over and over again. And you hear it, you hear it, not in your own language usually, but when you talk to people, right. And they're like, they're so good at being so adamant about what's not possible because of And so it's bringing attention to that and getting curious about that, that I'm trying to get people to start. Because again, I can go back to that time in my life and I was so vehement because of mistakes that I've made, because of changes that have happened, um, that that, that I would, I mean, I would fight with Bob about it. I would fight with him (laughs) about what was not possible because of. So that's what I want people to pay attention to. You know, I, I love that because I think that, you know, I grew up in a culture, uh, unfortunately, you know, we just had Mickey Argyle here. We're talking about how in the Indian culture, particularly for women, there's such a double standard mm. where I think they eventually with age, you know, if they're single, if an Indian woman is my age and single, I think she has a much worse time than I do being my age and single. Um, because that whole, oh, every day it's less and less possible for you to meet somebody or get married or have a baby or whatever it is really is pervasive in our culture. But I, I don't think we're alone when it comes to that. Mm -mm. Um, but I also appreciate the fact that you pointed out that there are things that are not going to be possible. Uh, we had a journalist named Will Storr here who wrote this. Oh, I love Will Storr. Um, Will had, was one of my favorite interviews last year. And he said, you know, this is what our culture does these days. It sets this unusually high standard for success that is so unrealistic that it's just toxic. We're taught Mm -hmm. to believe that if we're not Steve Jobs, Oprah, or Beyonce, that our life has no value. Um, Mm -hmm. and he said, it's just not true. No. And that's part of what I want people to go through with this process. And what I want to companion people to do is to leave behind those stories. And they may be very personal to you. They may not be a Beyonce story. They may be, I have chronic fatigue and therefore, and again, I'm not saying that there's things that aren't difficult or blocked for you, but there are so many things that are possible to be enjoyed, to be created, to be experienced. Yeah. We have such a limited idea of life purpose in the West. It's all about what it gets us or what it looks like, or it's arriving someplace like we were talking about earlier. And life purpose to me is how alive can I be? How present can I be? How much can I be here for it? And anything I do beyond that is gravy, but it's not purpose. Mm. Wow. So one thing that you said was that money will influence, shape, prevent, and enable how you bother. 
you'll be free as long as you refuse to use lack of money as your excuse to shut down your desire, as long as you refuse to buy the story that you're separate from life itself or that you have to purchase the willingness to bother. Now, Mm. obviously, you and I have addressed the people that have to survive. And to me, that passage right there is one that comes for both of us from the place of privilege that you and I are in. Mm -hmm. Uh, We're lucky enough that we can even consider this. There are a lot of people for whom this is not even a realistic consideration. Mm -hmm. Um, And yet, there are plenty of people who can realistically consider this and it's still they still don't have that freedom. I mean, you know, I, I made a choice that Dave Ramsey would cringe at by not choosing to pay off my student loan debt so I could build this career. Mm-hmm. And I thought to myself at the end of my life, if I do that, I'll have potentially gotten fired from a dozen more jobs. Um, <laughs> and, you know, my two summer read, read. paid off debt. <laughs> I think I've created far more value for the world by doing this, but financially it would be considered irresponsible. Well, these are the hard choices that, I want people to make, but I want them to be choices. I don't want them to be the default. I have to do it this way, like you've just explained in a great story. But I also don't want it to be the pie in the sky because I, I see people whose lives are wrecked because they built, they have bought into the law of attraction narrative or mm-hmm. the, oh my God, one of my students was telling me that there's now um, self-publishing companies that put the hard sell on you to self-publish. And if you say no, they're like, you don't really believe in your dreams, do you? Yeah. Like, we're, I'm not talking about any of that, but I am talking about the ways, just like you described, you really wrestled with that. You you thought about it hard. You didn't just blithely go, okay, I'm going to not pay off my student loans and damn the torpedoes. Well, maybe you did a little bit, but... <laughs> yeah. Hmm. So this is actually now I know why I did ask you about identity when uh, we we're talking about this because you did mention identity. So you've worked with your fair share of super successful people trapped by their identities as publishers, fashion designer, activist, surgeon, writer, business powerhouse, neuroscientist. Now, I have always been very wary of labels. Like I always tell people I hate the term podcaster so much so that when podcast movement asked me to do their keynote, I said, yes, I'll do it on one condition. They said, what? I don't have to talk about podcasting. <laughs> uh, and I said, look, I happen, I'm a storyteller who happens to use podcasting to tell, tell stories. That's one medium in which I tell stories. But i had always felt that labels create limitations and in that they limit what we think is possible in our lives. Um, yet, if you do something for a long enough timeline, you know, if you spend years doing something. I think even for me, you know, moving from California to Colorado, people, Jonathan Fields, when he met me for coffee, he said, so Boulder, huh? He said, but what about surfing? He's like, this is such a huge part of your identity. And I said, yeah, it is, but it's one part of my identity. And so, you know, I I wonder after somebody has been identified with something, whether that be, hey, I'm a parent, I'm an author, whatever it is for so long, how do they transcend that? Mm, Well, I think it's beginning. Well, one thing can happen is that you get really tired of the label. (laughs) And so you can begin to separate it from a little, you know, a little bit like you, you know, you've just expressed. Um, I also think that uh, when we're really, when we're really curious people who aren't clinging to those labels because they give us a sense of self. When we're, when we're willing to say, you know, the self, as far as we know it, is pretty much a construct. It doesn't really exist. We can't identify a self. It's a fluid story that we tell based on a tremendous amount of factors. So what's the story that I want to explore next? I was reading an article about um, mountaineering uh, in the New Yorker recently and about deaths, you know, because when you climb at a high level, you are much more likely to die. And and they were talking about how they have, you know, they get these contracts, and and this is very much a part of, of our life here in Boulder and people we know, that, you know, they get these contracts with North Face and Patagonia and et cetera to climb and to be photographed and, and, you know, make, make movies while they're doing these things that could kill them and often do. And it was such an interesting reflection on how that they struggle with the identity and the image that they have to project to make a living so they can go do this thing that they love. Um, New Yorker did an article a couple of years ago called hashtag van life. And it was exactly about the same thing. People who go after this, you know, free life in a van and then want to get sponsors. And then the free life goes away because they're having to construct a life that they can photograph to get other people to want that identity. 
So to me, it's just constantly kind of stepping back from it. You know, I, I, that's all I can do. And then trying to find the things that connect me to what matter, what really matters. And for me, that's often talking to my husband about the dark place I've gone to about identity questions and having him remind me that it doesn't matter. Mm. Um, but when we're not really psychologically or spiritually resourced, it's going to be really hard to do that because that's all we've got is that identity. So one thing I, I haven't asked you, uh, throughout our conversation earlier, you alluded to the fact that you have a daughter that works in a hospital. Um, and I wonder, this is, it's funny because I remember asking Danielle Laporte and I've asked a lot of people this, it's like, if you're a psychologist or you have this kind of work, um, as a parent, are you immune to the bullshit that all parents have to deal with because you're so well-versed in all this, which I always know the answer to that question is of course not, but I wonder how having had this life experience, having sort of this wealth of knowledge of, of sort of human behavior that you do, um, has shaped your relationship with your daughter. Oh, my, I have, I have a kid who came out with a, like a no bullshit look on her face. <laughs> I have a kid who she's 25 now and she very much knows, uh, how to cut through anything. So if anything, she pushed back and questioned and would say to me, I can remember multiple times when she would say, don't get a life coaching on me, mom. <laughs> Guess what she does? She works in psychology. <laughs> she works with um, kids who are hospitalized for mental illness. Um, so I think that what it did raising her was make me look at what didn't, what was I preaching or espousing that was bullshit and, and really start to drill down or what are the practices? What are the outlooks? What are the ideas what are the values that I want to share with people and live myself that really, really work or matter and always presenting them the same way that you present your ideas, which is try it for yourself. If it doesn't work or you need to change it right on, I don't know anything more about your life. Um, certainly not more than you do. Mm. So I, I, I think it's, you know, what, what, but I have a stepson too. And what Bob and I both say is that, you know, they seem to have taken in the good stuff and kept it and definitely cut through the stuff that now we're chagrin that we ever said. Yeah. I mean, I think that every time I talk to parents, I think of this one moment in the TV show Parenthood where it's the, the one of the very last episodes, the main character is sitting with her dad and he just looks at her and, you know, they have a conversation about, you know, all the things that have gone wrong in her life. And she's sitting there apologizing to him. And he said, parents screw their kids up. That's just what we do. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I have, I mean, talk about surrendering identity. You know, when you're doing it, you're like, oh, this is the most important thing. And everything I do is so important. And then you realize when you see another kid's, another friend's kid go off the rails or get addicted or, you know, and you're like, why didn't that happen to my kid? There's no reason why it didn't happen. I don't know what you know, confluence of things came together in her brain and body to make her more resilient. <laughs> and yeah, I, I, she makes me laugh. That's for sure. And I'm proud of her. So you get into talking about probably one of my favorite concepts. I think, um, you know, I've been off of Facebook for what month is it now? We're almost at April. So I quit, I think in February, and the last post I put there was what I learned from 30 days of quitting. And that was a month ago and I haven't been back since. Uh, you said this in, in the book, and I think particularly given where we're at at this moment in history, if there's one single thing that stands between most people and finding their desire to bother again, if they're pinging and zinging everywhere, scattered and interrupted at every turn. That mm -hmm. has been our default way of going through the world for almost the last 10 years. You and I both Jesus. know this. Because, I mean, I know about you because of this work and I found out about you because of social media, um, <laughs> you know, and it's, this is literally kind of the first time I've been away for it for so long. And I'm realizing it's fundamentally changing the way I'm thinking, um, <laughs> the way I'm writing, the way that everything is coming out in a good way. And the funny thing is now we're in a situation where this is really the only way we can connect with each other. <laughs> um, and I just, you know, I, I wonder what you would have to say about that. Well, I, I, um, oh, yeah, yeah, I tell you, I have such conflicted relationship with social media. 
Oh, there's so much here. So on one hand, I'm like, I need to be on social media for work, you know, to let people know, like you disappear to certain populations if you're not there. I resent it. I resent having to show up. I resent having to have things to say. I get so frozen around it that I won't show up for days because I'm like, what do I have to say that should take anyone's attention? I am making Facebook money by giving them the eyeballs. Oh yeah. my God. Um, I will go off line for days because I don't want to be experiencing my life through, should I take a picture of this? Could I look cute right. doing this? Will Bob and I look really in love if we do this? Um, and then it just gets, I get more and more frozen. Um, I also have a, a deep, and I write about this a little bit in the book, but I struggle a lot. Um, it's a lot better, but it's still there with a sense of belonging. Um, and so I really get triggered when friends are talking to each other, they don't invite me to things or, you know, or I feel left out of conversations and that can really spiral me to a dark place. Or if I post something and nobody says anything to it, you know, so yeah, it's, it's a complicated relationship for me at times and other times I don't even think about it, you know, if I'm in a good place and, and resourced and really, you know, deeply grounded in my, in my, in meditation and other things. But I think from the perspective of finding your bother, I will make a absolute statement that if you are having your phone go off all the time with announcements and people posting things, and if you are getting in inundated, and if you are on social media or texting or calling people every few minutes or even every hour, you will never settle down enough to go through the process in the book and discover what's next for you genuinely, deeply what you care about. Well, I think that makes a perfect segue to this concept of desire. You say to desire is to be vulnerable, to risk heartbreak, and to risk life. To desire often requires transgressing against the lessons of childhood, your past, your roles, and facing down the ways your culture, your job, and your community does and doesn't support you. And I think the part about uh, culture uh, and community not or not supporting you really struck me because you know I think that when you choose to do what I have and you've lived in an Indian community. <laughs> There's this constant sort of, oh, what do people think? Like, how do I explain that? You know, I mean, literally, I remember the, the first time I met an Indian doctor at some winery and he was like, what do you do? I was like, I write books. And he's like, is that profitable or is that <laughs> lucrative? And I'm like, you just pissed away all your money in a winery that doesn't make money and hasn't for four years. I was like, and you're asking me if it's profitable. What I do is profitable. Um, it just was one of those very bizarre sort of moments. But um, you talk about these three components of desire, self-determination, inspirational foreshadowing, and spiritual connection. Can you expand on those? Uh, um, well, to me, what desire gives us fundamentally is agency over our, our own lives. It doesn't mean we get everything we want, and nobody does. And it doesn't mean that everything's going to work out the way we want. Nobody gets that either. But if I can at least own even the simplest things, like, wow, I actually don't want anything for lunch that is in the refrigerator. If I really wish I could be at that Paris cafe and have that lunch that I had that time, and if I can own that for a moment and then see where it leads me, it sounds so stupid and innocuous, but it is, I have seen this with thousands of people I've worked with. When we begin to say, what is it that I want? What's my relationship with what I want? We begin to say, well, okay, where am I in this life? What decisions and choices am I making that are mine? How do I feel about not, you know, about being, you know, a doctor, for example, the guy that you were talking about, How, wh where's my agency in that? Without agency, there there is no what's next. There is no why bother because there's nobody home. And while I've seen this more with the women I've worked with than men, I definitely think it happens with guys. It just happens for different reasons, you know? Yeah. And spiritual foreshadowing and those other two things, I don't remember what I said. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I didn't, you know, get to write down the exact sections of them because I was like trying to get every, all my notes down. Um, I can open the book though and look. <laughs> oh, inspirational foreshadowing. Oh yeah. So um, uh, this idea that what we desire can give us a sense of what might lead us to what's next just straightforward like what where is desire leading us one of my favorite stories is from liz gilbert's book big magic when she writes about one day going huh maybe i'll order some seed catalogs and 
It's about that much desire, right? It's a mild interest. And then she gets obsessed with seeds and with gardening. And then two years later, she has gotten so obsessed and done so much research that she's ready to write her book, Signature of All Things, which is by far uh, her, I mean, what an incredible novel, Mm. right? So, but instead what we might do is go, well, why do I want seed catalogs? What's it going to get me? What, what, you know, does this mean something? Should I start a seed catalog business? right? We jump way ahead. We don't, and we, and we insist again that it get us something rather than maybe it's just that you want to plant a garden and you would find that interesting or pleasant, or you'd like some fresh cucumbers this summer. Hmm. (laughs) So I want to come full circle with what I think is another incredibly relevant uh, quote from your book particularly given where we're at and what we're going through. It's kind of funny. You and I, you know, I told you I moved here to Boulder and we were talking about getting together for dinner and somehow that plan all just, you know, I guess the world had very different plans for us. Mm -hmm. But you said our brains need to interact with the world. We need human connection to be whole, which is why solitary confinement becomes, confinement becomes a form of torture. We might deny our need for others, resist it, have to work through trauma to repair our ability to connect, but without it, we can't thrive. We can't bother when we're alone. We need to give our gift to others. And what I wonder is in your own life, how has what we're going through right now with this crisis changed the way that you're connecting with other people? Well, I'm definitely connecting more. I'm calling people more, which is something I tend to not do. I'm, you know, we had, you know, seeing our neighbors more, as I said, out on the street, so, you know, six feet apart from each other. And I mean, little things, you know, like sometimes we, we have a very dynamic, loving, friendly neighborhood. We go on vacations together with our neighbors, stuff like that. And there'll be plenty of times when like I see somebody, I'll be like, I'm going to walk the other way with the dog because I don't have time to talk because I got to get home and do my work. I'm definitely not doing that now. Um, Lily and I, my daughter, we have a tendency to text more. You know, she's of the generation that doesn't want to get on the phone. I've been FaceTiming her. I've been like, making her FaceTime with me. <laughs> um, just, you know, I just hung out with her for a while yesterday and watched her work. She's working at home. She's quarantined because she's been exposed to the virus. Um, you know, so definitely I feel that urge to to take the time. My default is to be super driven and it just doesn't seem as important right now. Mm. Um, And I find myself doing some of that, you know, shutting down a little bit and and really needing to sort of make the effort to do that. Um, So it's coming in waves where I'm really hungry to connect with people and I make the effort and then we're all just go to bed and, and read a book. Wow. Um, well, I feel like I could talk to you all day because this is a very deep rabbit hole. <laughs> it's one of those concepts, this idea of why bother that it it's hard to put it into sound bites. I'm finding as I'm doing interviews, it's really, I, I think the most important thing I want people to know though, is that when we ask the question, why bother? What's the point? Like you said it when you were talking about the, your agent turning back proposal after proposal, we start to think we know the answer and it's, there's no point. You know, we start, we start to answer the question in the negative. And my biggest idea here is that when we're asking it, there's a reason and we've got to get curious and slow down and settle in. And it's scary and it's hard. And I try to give you as many pointers and stories as possible, but because you're asking is not a sign that something's the matter or that this is some, you know, everything's, fucked, it's a sign that life is trying to get to you in a new way. Hmm. So I want to finish with my final question, um, which is how we finish all of our interviews. And it's funny because I think I've asked you this question years ago. So I'm curious to see how you will answer it now. (laughs) Hopefully in a new and wisdom way, much wiser way. (laughs) What do you think it is that makes somebody or something unmistakable? Oh, I would say a quality of knowing and trusting and loving, accepting themselves. Hmm. Yeah, I really would. I, when I think about someone, when I think about the people in my life that I remember or that are unmistakable to me, they have such a sense of self-acceptance and acceptance of others and acceptance of what life brings. Immediately, some different people professionally and personally come to mind. So yeah, that's what I would say. Hmm. Amazing. 
Well, um, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to join us and uh, share your insights and your wisdom with our listeners. Where can people find out more about you, your work, and uh, the new book? JenniferLoudon.com is where you find me. And then the book, it's at JenniferLoudon.com forward slash why dash bother. JenniferLoudon.com forward slash why dash bother. And then there's all kinds of pre-order goodies that we're doing and you can get a free chapter right away. So if you're definitely in the why bother time, you can be like, okay, there's something to read right now. (laughs) Amazing. And for everybody listening, we will wrap the show with that. Hey, did you know that every Sunday our community manager, Melina, sends out 10 key takeaways from episodes just like this one? All you have to do to receive it is sign up for our newsletter. Just visit unmistakablecreative.com slash newsletter and you'll get them delivered right to your inbox. Again, that's unmistakablecreative.com slash newsletter. ACAST powers some of the world's best podcasts. Here's a show we recommend. Hey, I'm Bert from The Bert Show. You have people on a show that really don't like morning shows. Blair said, I think I'm falling in love with you, and I went, Why take initiative when you can take a net? I like keeping it real, and I like keeping it gross. <laughs> so we created a show that we really wanted to hear. It's real, and it's funny, and we will talk about our personal lives. We're not scared of anything. I'm on the phone with your husband, Bart, and he says, I love you. I'm not <laughs> sure that I gave him a confident enough I love you back. And I do have feelings for him. I, I think I'm falling <laughs> <laughs> what I love most about this show is everybody's vulnerability. And though our perspectives may be different, working together is actually fun. We put the fun in dysfunction. I think it's unlike anything that you've heard before. The Bird Show. Listen to this show on ACAST or wherever you get your podcasts. ACAST, A-Cast, A-Cast, A-Cast recommends. recommends.